Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to thank, uh, thank you for letting me speak today. Um, we're going to be talking about like peg complications. I have nothing to disclose. So we're just going to go over some objectives. Um, we're going to review some of the later complications of peg tube insertion and then how to sort of um, some strategies and management um, of how we actually deal with them. Um, so you actually heard first about the early complications. So in general, these are some of the uh, complications from peg tube or enteral access, uh, which include GI bleeding and tube dislodgement, which you just heard about, um, peristomal leakage, uh, cellulitis, necrotizing fasciitis, buried bumper syndrome, and then some other two are gastrocolocutaneous fistulas and tumor seeding. But the three that I'm going to focus on today are the three in the middle. So in terms of peristomal leakage, it's actually one of the most common complications, and I put that in quotes really because um, some amount of leakage is always about, is normal. So it's reported by about 75% of patients, but probably underreported as well. Um, but a small amount of leakage is normal, so I wouldn't, sometimes I don't necessarily call it a complication and more of the natural history of peg tubes. And it's, the leakage occurs mostly because the stoma dilates over time um, as, as, the, as the peg is kept in longer. So some of the risk factors for peristomal leakage include um, infection and hy gastric hypersecretion. Uh, if you clean it with hydrogen peroxide with a lot of acid, it also uh, irritates the skin, um, and that can also cause increasing leakage. A lot of torsion and uh, tension on the peg tube, and I know it's already been um, talked about already, but we're going to really uh, drive home this point of uh, trying not to put a lot of tension or torsion on the peg. Um, buried bumper syndrome, which I'm going to talk about later, is also one of the risk factors for leakage. Um, putting corrosivation through the tube can also stimulate a lot of uh, secretions, and that can cause a lot of leakage as well. And factors for poor wound healing, such as diabetes, malnutrition, or immunosuppression, can also uh, lead to some increased leakage. So in terms of treatment, um, first is really conser doing conservative management, so using barrier creams and skin protections containing zinc oxide, or if they have a fungal infection around the tube, putting some antifungal uh, powders or creams around that. You really want to optimize uh, medical and nutritional status as much as possible, um, and again, really uh, relieving any excessive torsion or tension on the, on the external bolster. You can also try using anti-secretory uh, therapy, uh, such as PPIs or Carifate. Um, that can sometimes be useful. Um, and the really, um, this is one of the counterintuitive points sometimes, is really avoid placing a larger peg tube in. Because, uh, because the way leakage happens is really because the stoma dilates over time, that if you put a larger peg in, it, the, the, actually, the hole um, is actually going to enlarge bigger, and you're going to have more leakage down the road. So you actually don't want to do that. So in terms of if you have an excessive amount of leakage, we actually talked about this or touched on this yesterday, but um, in terms of ways that we can deal with that, um, if it's an excessive amount, you can actually have endoscopic measures. Um, you can try, try, to try to tighten the gastrostomy tube tract. Um, you can do that with either clips, uh, poly loops, or endoluminal suturing. Uh, sometimes you can give a peg holiday, so you can remove the tube for a few days, and that'll help to close the tract a little bit and then replace it with the same uh, size tube, and that will allow for a partial closure of the tract so that it might create a tighter seal. The last resort is really complete removal of the peg. I don't think I personally have had to do this, um, and then placing a new peg in a different site. And just so you have to understand, that last, that's really a last resort because um, the same issues are going to arise again if we don't really deal with the preventative measures first. So in terms of infectious complications, that's actually relatively common as well. It occurs in about 5 to 25 percent of cases. Um, there's some uh, great randomized control trials which look at the use of uh, perioperative um, IV antibiotics. Um, there's level uh, 1A evidence saying that you can actually reduce the infection rate down to 3 percent. So usually you only have to give one dose preoperatively, and that's usually enough, either of a penicillin or a cephalosporin. Um, necrotizing fasciitis is quite rare. So in terms of risk factors, it's the same kind of risk factors that occur with just gen uh, in general for infections, um, diabetes, obesity, malnutrition, really related to wound healing as well, uh, malignancy. And then in terms of technical factors, the size of the tube and the size of the opening, really because if the, it's a larger tube and a larger size opening, there's a lar um, greater chance of infection. And then in technique, there's actually been a few papers that show that uh, the um, whole technique has a little bit higher uh, complication rate than the introducer technique, but that's not that significant, at least not significant enough to change um, the technique that you should use. <laughs> 
So in terms of treatment, um, really allowing adequate drainage around the peg tube and loosening the external bumper. You don't really want to have any of the uh, secretions um, really pooling around the skin because that will make things worse. And uh, using antibiotics if necessary. Um, and this patient, is, um, you can actually see there's like necrotic skin around it. So this would be uh, uh, one that we would have, might have to incise and drain some of the soft tissue. And in sometimes those cases, you actually have to remove the tube um, and allow closure of the tract, in which case down the road, you might need to replace the tube. So in terms of the last complication I'll be talking about today is buried bumper syndrome. Um, and this is really when the PEG tube migrates into the abdominal wall and there's some subsequent epithelialization. Um, this occurs, it's hard to know in the literature, but it's somewhere between 1.5 to 9%. Um, and you can see in these CT scans how that usually presents. The PEG tube is either um, in various locations that are outside of the stomach. So it either is in like the, um, in, the in between the layers of the stomach, um, outside, um, or in the interior abdominal wall. And this usually is a later complication once a mature tract is formed. Um, and this presents typically between months to years. It can occur as early as three weeks um, and as late as like a few years, three years, but in the median it's about 18 months from peg tube insertion. So in terms of the symptoms or what you should be looking for if you're suspecting this um, is really if, you, um, if the patients are having abdominal pain with feeding, um, they're not able to flush or infuse anything through the tube, um, there's swelling around the peg tube, there's increased leakage, and if you're not able to rotate their tube and there's no free movement of the tube, then you can sort of suspect that that's, this might be an issue. Um, and in terms of the complications that can occur from this, um, they can also lead to wound infections, peritonitis, and necrotizing fasciitis, peritonitis being a little bit less common because the tract is formed. So in terms of prevention, um, these are things that you don't want to be seeing. Um, one, the one on the left, um, there's a lot of gauze that's underneath the peg tube that puts a lot of tension in between the external and internal bumpers, and that's what can cause the erosion to occur in the first place. So we actually try to avoid that as much as possible. And on the picture on the right, um, it's a, it seems to be really tight, at least to me, and that can be causing a lot of tension in between the two bolsters. This actually occurs a little bit less often now that we have the soft cup um, internal bolsters because they're a little softer. They don't tend to um, erode as much, but it's always, a risk, um, regardless, um, a lot of tension between the internal and external bolsters can do that. So this is something that we don't want to see at all. So if you need to put gauze around it, I usually put it on top of the um, external bolster and not underneath. So this is what you really want to see, is that you want your peg tube not on a lot of tension at all. I usually allow about one to one and a half centimeters uh, between the skin and the external bolster. That allows a lot of... Um, of mobility, um, and you really just want to try to avoid that tension. So in terms of treating it when you do have buried bumper, um, usually I, uh, the peg should either be removed or managed as soon as the diagnosis is made, and there's a few ways that you can do that. Um, some, most of the time, uh, most successfully, you can just put some external traction on the tube and just remove the tube in general. Um, you can use endoscopy, which I'm going to show a picture of, and either just, if, you, if you still can't remove it, sometimes you actually have to make a surgical incision over the site to remove the tube um, completely. Sometimes you may need some antibiotics and skin care if there is some signs of infection. Um, you may need some temporary alternative access to um, enteral feeding um, if the tube is removed completely, um, and you, but you may be able to use the same tract. So I'm just going to illustrate some pictures in terms of salvaging. Um, so the picture A is really what, uh, what a buried bumper looks like. You can either try to just remove the tube in general. Um, sometimes in certain circumstances, if, you're, if it's completely um, epithelialized, you can actually use a needle knife to try to uh, in the area that you can see where the buried bumper is and try to actually incise that endoscopically. Um, in terms of removing the tube, if you're having a lot of difficulty with external traction, you can either put a um, balloon dialer through the, balloon, uh, through the peg tube externally, dilate the tract so you can actually remove it. And then the, la the last one on E is um, a push-pull T um, technique where you actually put a snare endoscopically, feed it outside, you cut the tube, and then try to push and pull to actually remove the tube endoscopically. Um, the last picture on the right is one where you can actually use a sphincter tome through it and try to actually incise around the peg to try to salvage the tract, but there's been a lot of complications such as bleeding and perforation that can occur from that. Um, so I, I typically haven't used that strategy, but um, the one that I use the most is really just removing the tube. So really um, preventing and um, making sure you have an early diagnosis of this is really key to um, recognizing the complications, and, but the management is relatively straightforward. Um, so I hope that was helpful. Um.